and uh and i really think if that didn't happen that just shifted all the momentum in the bucks favor um you know if rogers doesn't throw that interception um you know maybe they maybe the packers maybe the packers get a touchdown maybe even they get a field goal but i just think that um that that was the real turning point of that game you could make an argument as to like what it was what like happened later in the game which i will also talk about so uh yeah and and if you remember last week i said uh if kevin king plays that really wouldn't matter you know he's like the number two or three cornerback um uh, yeah it clearly mattered because he was involved in the two biggest plays of the game that's that, that i mean this entire season i was a i was a master at predicting you know i picked against the steelers versus uh versus washington but uh and washington won i did so many other good predictions and this one i was just wrong kevin kevin king was so important to that game in a negative fashion for the packers and it, so yeah that's unfortunate first like majorly wrong prediction i've had this year but um yeah now on to the packers rogers if you look at the stats he had a he had a good game, you know, I think he had like two interceptions, which is not ideal, but you know, what are you gonna do, one was a little, uh, was a little, uh, I'm not gonna say cheap or anything like that, it was right before the end of the half, they were trying to drive downfield, Sean Murphy Bunting just like, played, had a perfect ball, so I guess it isn't that cheap, but you know, it is what it is, he had one or two interceptions, but um, and, and, um, they had to rely on Rodgers since that, run game just could not get anything going Aaron Jones a- uh, AJ Dillon and Jamal Williams you look at that backfield and you're like that's a good backfield but they just could not get anything going versus the likes of Shaquille Barrett Levante David um Devin White um uh Dom Kim Su, um and those guys on the Buccaneers and the Packers also really had to rely on that suspect defense and that is a major key that they need to improve on that and getting another weapon for Aaron Rodgers, which, at this point, who even knows if Aaron Rodgers is going to be the starter for the Packers at this point? We've already seen one NFC North quarterback go. Might be time for another, and possibly a third. The only team in the NFC North that really is certain at quarterback right now, I guess, is now technically the Lions, but, um, and the Vikings with Kirk Cousins, which that did not work out. But yeah, um, they, they, they just... The Packers just could not, they they just could not get anything going in the run game. The defense could not get any stops whatsoever. And the Bucks just really contained Devontae Adams. He only had like 65 yards. And if you look at Aaron Rodgers' stats, um, he had like 200 yards, but 100 of them were to Marquez Valdez Scantling, and 50 of those yards were on a, tu- on a deep touchdown. Uh, so I, I just think that the Packers just need to assess their quarterback situation, because obviously they have um, Jordan Love, who they drafted in this first round. They traded up with the Dolphins to get him. Thank you for doing that, by the way. Um, so, and yeah, like I was saying, um, they, they need to assess that quarterback position, are, because, like, obviously, are they going to keep, uh, are they going to keep uh, Aaron Rodgers, or are they going to go with Jordan Love? And then also, they, like, this is not even a, uh, do they, it's a they do situation. They need to get a better defense and a more wide receivers because, like, Devontae Adams, Aaron Jones, Robert Tonyan, that's an amazing, those are three amazing weapons for, um, Aaron Rodgers. But you look at other teams, like, uh, per se, the Buccaneers, you, you have Gronk, Fournette, who, you know, is, is not, um, he's not super great, he's not, like, the top running back in the game or whatever, but he's still, like, good, like, Gronk, Fournette, Ronald Jones, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, uh, even Cameron Brate had a good, had a decent season for being a number two tight end, um, you just look at teams like that, and, and you realize how, um, uh, not, I'm trying, of how weak, the position core um, for the for the Packers are. Jamal Williams, I think, is a great number two back. 
Um, I think A.J. Dillon is a great number three back. Like, the running backs, I think, are good, uh, really good for the Packers. It's just, uh, there's like one or two positions on the O-line that they need to fix. Obviously, Elton Jenkins was a pro bowler. David Bakhtiari was a pro bowler, but unfortunately, he couldn't play, which is, which is a big factor. I think David, if David Bakhtiari played, and Packers would have a, would have definitely made a better shot at winning. Um, so, that's a big loss for them, but they just need to get more wide receivers, so whether they go out and trade for a guy, or they get a guy in the draft, or they sign someone, um, maybe they get a guy like Allen Robinson, because Devontae Adams, he's their, like, little, like, dink and dunk, slant routes type of guy, and then Allen Robinson can be that deep threat guy, guy that can just go, just j- win 50-50 balls, you know, in the end zone. Granted, that is what they have in Marquez Valdez-Scantling, but Allen Robinson is much better than Scantling, so... I, I definitely think the Packers need to really, really do some thinking in this offseason here. Um, you know, like, thinking about different positions and what they want to do there because that defense just is not good enough to win playoff games as we've seen the past couple of years. Their run defense got absolutely shredded last year in the NFC Championship game versus the uh, 49ers. And then this year, they just, they, not only could they not, offense not get anything going versus a good um defense because you only need to contain three different people, um, their defense just cannot hold up, so I, I just really do think the Packers need to do some deep thinking about their defense and getting some weapons for Aaron Rodgers, um, and if they're gonna keep him, because honestly, who knows at, at this point with, with, um, with Aaron Rodgers' future, he says it's a beautiful mystery, and, uh, to be honest, that, that's a good point, um, so yeah, Packers, Lose to the Buccaneers, 31-26. to Oh, wait. How could I forget? I am such a buffoon. Yeah, let's talk about that, um, that, uh, field goal call. I don't like that. And I'm gonna do my best Kirk Cousins impersonation. I guess I'm changing up the phrase, but I don't like that. I don't like that. You're down by eight. It's not like you're down by, let's say, four, and you get a field goal, and now you're down by one, and a field goal wins the game. No, you would still need a touchdown either way. And here's the thing. You kick the field goal. Say they get a touchback, which is what I believe they did. They get the ball at the 25. Meanwhile, if you go for the touch touchdown, and let's say, unless you get sacked or there's a penalty or something like that, even if you get, like, five yards, you're at the three-yard line. Because, granted, they were at the eight-yard line. You have one of the best wide receivers, top top ten, maybe even top five tight end, top ten running back. It's... It just confuses me, and you have the MVP. MVP. It just doesn't make sense. You down by eight. It's not a field. A field goal doesn't do anything for you. If you were down by six, that's a different story. Because then yes, two field goals do tie it. But still, at the same time, even unless they would have taken the lead with a field goal or even tied it. So the only situations where you go for a field goal in that situation is is where it's uh, you're down by um, you have the opportunity to take the lead or tie it. If you if you're still gonna be down after kicking a field goal, you you take that you go for the touchdown at least because it's just the Bucks have been torching your defense all game. What do you think is the likely cha- likelihood that that they're gonna do it now? Like, very unlikely. Granted, it could happen. They had three timeouts, and and uh, they had uh, three timeouts and the two minute warning on their side, so t- four timeouts. So, and, and, which is helpful, but at the same time, it's like eventually something's gonna break through. And when you go for, and then you go for the touchdown, if, even if you don't get it, which is totally fine. Then. Um, even if you don't get it, and let's say you get five, six, or seven yards because they were at the eight yard line, you got the one, two, or three yard line. A sack gets you points, and then gets you two points. So now let's say it would be thirty-one to twenty-five. You get the ball back, say around the fifty, with two minutes to go, practically in all three timeouts, and you need a touchdown and an extra point when you have the MVP. Like I was saying. MVP, top five wide receiver, top five possibly tight end, top five possibly running back. Even if the, those two are in top five, you you still at like six or seven right there for them. So 
you have to go 50 yards in like a, a minute 55 with all three timeouts. I like my chances. Let, let's let me just put it that way. I like my chances of me doing that to be honest. And uh, I, I, it's just, I really do like Matt Lafleur. I think he is a gr- fantastic coach. I, I think, I don't think his his legacy with the Packers will be remembered by one plane, because if I mean obviously if they don't win a Super Bowl or anything like that, then maybe it will. But if they you know do win a Super Bowl or they just continue to be good, I don't think people give it twenty years will remember this call and be like, eh. Yeah, that's still a bad call because, yes, it will forever be a bad call. But I just don't think it's something that in 20 years we're going to be like, oh, yeah, I am, I remember when they did that. Uh, so, yeah, in the in the moment, it, it is a horrible decision by Matt, Matt LaFleur. But like I said, I like Matt LaFleur. I think he's a fantastic coach. Um, I, I really liked what he did to, you know, like, to break down that toxicity in the Green Bay locker room, because it obviously wasn't getting to, like, extreme measures. But, you know, Mike McCarthy and Aaron Rodgers didn't have a great relationship. That's why he was fired. Um, you know, and at first people weren't sure how it was going to work out, and now look at them. They were, like, they were best friends at this point. So I just think that Matt LaFleur is a great coach still, but that just one play... Well, yeah, it will be remembered for the next five or so years, but then not much after that. Um, but yeah, Packers lose to the Buccaneers 31-26 in the NFC Championship game. That is unfortunate. Tom Brady is in his 10th, count of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 Super Bowls, that's unbelievable. And um, Buccaneers are in the Super Bowl since are in the Super Bowl. For the first time since 2003, back when they won it with John Gruden as their head coach. Um, so, yeah, that that's pretty exciting for all you Buccaneers fans. You've had to witness the tragedy of, Mar- uh, not Marcus Mariota, of Jameis Winston. Um, you know, so, yeah, and Doug Martin, another, you know, draft bust. But so, anyway, yeah, Buccaneers are back in the Super Bowl. Happy for all you um, Buccaneers and Tom Brady fans. And, uh... Yeah, as unfortunate as, as as much as we all like don't like it, it's it's reality at this point, and I've accepted it. But I still think that the um, that the uh, that the uh, Chiefs will can pull it out. But um, yeah. Now, all right. One thing I forgot to mention was that um, I don't know why this is so far down in my notes, but here, but um. I have a certain rule change, I guess. And uh, what it is, it's coaches get one, count them, one penalty review. So, for example, on that pass interference call, LaFleur could have challenged for a holding had he not done it previously. And it's not like a normal challenge where if you win, you get it back. You get one and one only. And it can only be used... In, within the two-minute warnings. Because, you know, no one's going to remember a bad call from the middle of the first quarter or the middle of the th- third quarter. No one's going to remember that. Unless it's just so bad, like the Nola No call, which obviously wasn't, um, happened in the middle of the third quarter. Unless it's just a call so bad that, um, you know, like, it, it's going to be, like, horrible or anything like that. Um, you... Like yeah, like I said, it's you can only do it in the two minute warning. Uh, you only get one per game, one and one only. And uh, and like for why I'm saying in the two minute warning, so it doesn't slow down the game during the like main part of the game. <coughs> because everyone says that like, oh the pace of play is so bad. Granted, that's mostly with the MLB, but that's another problem for another day. But, yeah, you know, like, the pace of play is so bad in the two minute warnings. Oh, yeah, what's another two minutes going to do to you, you know? Um, so, to, to, you know, like, keep the pace of play going in the, you know, like, in the not crunch times and then, you know, in the crunch time, um, you know, that um, when it truly matters that you can do this. So, yeah, like I was saying with that example... If LaFleur threw that challenge flag, I don't know if they would have a separate flag. It would just be the same one. Um, so, 
though the challenge flag is like, oh, I think I saw holding on that play, he could do that. And then, you know, the refs would go look, and, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, there was holding. So then they call the penalty. Then, uh, which I don't think that would have taken two minutes. I think it would have taken, like, five seconds because you get one angle, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's definitely holding. So, you know, it takes, like, ten seconds or whatever, but, you know, the commercials just take, like, a minute. But, yeah, they come back. They was like, yeah, holding on the offense, number 84. I don't even know any, I don't know, like, 68 or something like that. I think it's Tristan Wilkes' number. Um, you know, since it was also passing the uh, offsetting penalties, just to replay it down or whatever, or whatever the case would be. Um, so yeah, I I think I think that's a I, I I think it's a good rule. I think it's something that makes sense, something that can avoid these things. You know, like had this happened, you know, back in twenty eighteen, I believe it was with the Nola no call, and uh, you know. Sean, and since I, I still don't know, understand how you missed that, you're standing right there. Or you know, I hate to do this to you, Cream and Dean, if you what if you're uh, watching this, but like the Daniel Sorensen hit, uh, Stefanski could have said, "Look, that's helmet to helmet. That's illegal. Um, that should be a penalty." So, uh, had he done that, then you know, maybe that game plays out differently. You know, maybe that uh, game plays out differently. So, I think it's a, I think that's a good idea. Um, this whole um, penalty challenge. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Um, you know, maybe give me. You know, maybe give some it, um different ideas to you know that I can tweak it, make it better. Obviously, this isn't gonna happen because you know, um, just, yeah, it's just not. So yeah, uh, that's that. That's it for the a NFC Championship game. Now on to the NFC AFC Championship, which um, the score may not look like it, but this game was an absolute massacre. The 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 Bills were outmatched, outcoached, and outplayed by the by the Chiefs. Or the Bills were. It, it just it seemed that like the Bills like you know something good happens and then they they take one step forward and then seven steps back. Josh Allen was running for his life. Every other play. He was their leading rusher. They have not had a good run game this entire season. They were the second most pass-happy team in the NFL behind the Chiefs. And, uh, I, and obviously, it just that off type of offense just didn't work because Andy Reid was like, hmm, well, or whoever calls the plays on defense, well, if they're super pass-heavy and they only have five at the most, like, six blockers, you know, if I just send, like, six or seven guys, you know, only really, you know, like, and if I can just force Josh Allen out of the pocket and let his inaccuracy that we've seen so many times before um, get the better of him, then, uh, you know, that, that's that's good because then, um, you know, force bad passes, force interceptions, force turnovers of any kind. So, that and that's exactly what the defensive play caller did for the Chiefs. He was like, all right, they're going to block five. I'm going to bring six or seven because they have some of the best blitzing safeties in the league other than uh, Jamal Adams, a.k.a. Blitz Boy, and um, Jabril Peppers. I believe Jabril Peppers is so underrated. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, with Daniel Sorensen and, and uh, Tyron Matthew just shooting up the gaps, then, um, then you know, he, he's just Josh Allen was just forced to run, and no matter where he went, one side was Tyron Matthew. Do you want to take a hit from him, or do you want to take a hit from Daniel Sorensen? And you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. So you're forced to run backwards and around and all that. And he's just, it's, he's just the, the Chiefs are just have some of the smartest coaches in the NFL, all the way from Andy Reid to their special teams coordinator. However, I, I guess not because Nicole Hugman had a, uh, a muffed punt. But anyway. I personally just think the Chiefs have some of the best coaches in the NFL. Um, you know, with Andy Reid, obviously, in my opinion, the best coach, the best head coach in the NFL. Um, uh, and also with Eric Bieniemy, the offensive coordinator, who should get a, a, a head coaching job. It's, just, it's, it's a disaster at this point with him. Poor Texans, poor Deshaun Watson. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 it's just... 
Josh Allen was, like I said, he was barely running for his life, and thus his 58.3 completion percentage, which is not good at all. Um, and that same reaction that I had earlier that I said when the when I um when the Bucks won, um, this is my exact reaction when I found out that Travis Hill and uh Travis Hill, Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey combined for 90 percent of the passing yards of uh from or receiving yards from Patrick Mahomes. And it, it amazes me that people still say their offense is more than just them. No, no, it isn't. Yeah, you got Clyde Edwards Hilaire who's gonna catch like three passes a game, get like two carries. Le'Veon Bell is gonna get one catch and one carry a game. Oh yeah, they have McCole Hugman. Yeah, he he's there too. Yeah, I totally remembered him. Uh it's just amazing that people still believe that if if that their offense is more than just them. So, and like I said, the run game didn't have to do much since Mahomes was playing so good. Um, I, I s- still personally think that Mahomes is overrated by the media. Not by people, by media. Um, because, yes, Patrick Mahomes is amazing. He's an amazing player. One of the best, if not the best, the best quarterback in the game. Um, so, uh, I, I just think that the um, I I just think that uh, he is the best, and so anyway, he's overrated by media still. But back to my point, like I was saying, the run game didn't have to do much because he was playing so good with Toe Toe and a possible minor concussion. Just imagine what he can do when he's fully healthy. Scary. So anyway, it, it's just it's it's just baffling how good he is. Um. But yeah, and then for the Bills, they just could not do anything on offense. I I, I, I still have no clue how they got 24 points somehow. It, it looked like a 50-point like deficit with the with the way that the Chiefs were playing and how poorly the Bills were playing. And, and now I'm going to do my little offseason uh, synopsis for the Bills now. That O-line, it has to get better. They, they, they just have to. They have to resign Dale Williams. They have to resign anyone... And anyone that they possibly can on that O line to, um, to, you know, to hold up for their next, uh, for their generational talent and Josh Allen, and whether that's drafting one, whether that's signing one from the agency, whether that's trading for one, whatever it is, they just need that offensive line to be able to hold up versus these elite defensive lines. Uh, you think of teams like like the Chiefs that we've seen. Um, or teams that like to blitz safeties and corners. Um, so, I just think that O-line is definitely the weak point, you know, along with um, maybe, like, the linebacking core. Um, you just, and maybe the tight end and running back. So, you just adjust, you just, you only, because, like, wide receiver is, is stacked. You got Stephon Diggs, Cole Beasley, Gabriel Davis. That's fine. Tight end, Dawson Knox. Yeah, he he's he's super athletic and all that, but he's not. I don't think. I think there there was he's not an amazing tight end. Definitely could improve on that. Running backs, granted, this is mostly on the offensive line, but um, uh, Devin Singletary and Zach Moss. Yes, I think Zach Moss can be good. Um, he just wasn't given his fair share of opportunities because they would try because they would throw the ball so much, but um. You know, I, I think I don't think Devin Singletary is, is um the answer. I'd much rather I'd like to see Zach Moss get most of the carries for the Bills. Um and then, you know, uh on defense, you know, maybe the linebacking court cuz it's not amazing. I believe Matt Milano is a free agent. They they have to resign him, I think. He's an important part to that offensive line, not the best linebacker obviously they have on that team, I believe. That goes to Tr- uh Tremaine Edmonds. Um I believe that's his name, uh, I believe that's his correct name, because they were, like, three Edmund brothers in the NFL, um, so, yeah, just working on the O-line, running back, and, um, tight end, Dawson Knox is fine, I believe, um, when you have Stephon Diggs, and that wide receiver court, um, just running backs, and O-line, and linebackers, that's really all the Bills need to work on, um, in this offseason, so, yeah, like, it's basically the same thing I'm gonna say for the Packers, whether that's 
trading for a guy, you know, uh, who's on a bad team or signing one. Or I believe Trent Williams is a free agent. That would be a huge pickup for for either one of the Packers or Bills. I think that's a could be a really, really, really good pickup for either one of those teams to just help out with that O line. Obviously, Bills need to assign Daryl Williams. He's he's a pretty good right tackle in my opinion. You just have those two tackles, Trent Williams. Dale Williams on the Bills, and you sit in Cody. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's really all the Bills need to do um, in the offseason, in my opinion, and then they can just come right back here to the AFC Championship game um, and hopefully win it next year. I, I feel so bad for Bills Mafia. They they deserve they deserve a ring. Um, they've, they've been through so much. <laughs> four straight Super Bowl losses. I still can't get over that. How do you lose four straight Super Bowls? Um, yeah, um, Chiefs, what looked like a complete massacre, um, defeat the Bills 38-24 to in the AFC Championship to play in the Super Bowl versus Tom Brady uh, in his 10th Super Bowl. I think that's unbelievable. Um, um, but yeah, uh, here, here's a little joke that I made, uh, bef- um, you know, um, this past week. I was like, can't do Brady versus Mahomes in the, in the, uh... AFC Championship, you know what's the best next th- next best thing? The Super Bowl. Um, so, I mean, obviously I'm not saying like the NFL is rigged or anything like that. Of course it isn't. Um, I just find it ironic that, you know, the past like three seasons it's like, oh, B- Mahomes versus Brady, oh, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a great matchup. Oh, it's like one of the best matchups in, in NFL history. It's like, yeah, cool and all that. Um and now I just find it ironic that instead of the AFC Championship game, they're doing it in the Super Bowl, which is an even bigger stage, in my opinion. Uh, so, yeah. Um, you know, time, date, and all that. February 7th at 6.30 Eastern. Um, I, If I had to guess, that's going to be around four and a half hours, so I'd expect it around, to end around 11 o'clock, assuming nothing crazy happens, you know, like triple overtime, that would be insane, um, so yeah, Tampa Bay, first team in NFL history to play in their home stadium for the Super Bowl, so sad, um, poor Vikings, they, they had the chance to do it the other way, but they stepped in the, but they had to face up against playoff Nick Foles, the absolute legend himself, um, so yeah, um, yeah, that, that's uh, that's a pretty interesting fact. I bet you all know it at this point. But yeah, Tampa Bay is the first team to play their home stadium for a Super Bowl. And um, yeah, we will, um, obviously, since Kareem and Dino in here, I'm not going to give, you know, like my full thoughts on this. I will just say, I believe the uh, the Chiefs will, will uh, win by more than two possessions. I'm, I'm just saying it. I'm just saying I, I think it. I think it'll happen. Um, all right, and now onto top performers for quarterback. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but we are going to give this to Patrick Mahomes, twenty nine for thirty eight, which is a seventy six point three completion percentage, three three hundred twenty five yards, three touchdowns for a QBR of one thirty six point nine. That is incredible. Running back. No, none of these teams had a good running game this um, this week, but if I had to pick someone, I would give it to Leonard Fournette, 12 for 55 for an average of 4.6 and a touchdown. Had that nice 20-yard touchdown in the second quarter where he trucked a guy. Uh, that's pretty cool. And due to the lack of teams, only going to be one running back and one t- and one running uh, wide receiver. Um, wide receiver and, and uh, wide receiver and tight end. This should be clearly. This is so obvious. Travis Kelsey for tight end, 13 for 118 and two touchdowns. And then for Tyree Kill, 9 for 172. Oh, I, I had no clue his stats were that good. I, I saw, I was like, because pretty much I knew he went insane and I just checked like all the other um, box scores and I didn't like see anyone with like incredible stats. Like, yeah, because Godwin had a good game, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I did not. Realize he had 172 yards. I wonder. That's a good question. I wonder what um is the most amount of receiving yards in an uh in a cha- in a playoff game of all time. If I had to guess, 
I, I don't know, 172 might be cutting close to the Ueku, but if I had to guess, it'd be around like 187. I don't know. That's just a random number that popped into my head. D line, we're going to give this to Frank Clark, who I still can't believe made the Pro Bowl of Companion Logba. Still so mad about that. Literally makes no sense. Uh, had two sacks um, on Josh Allen, which makes a bunch of ses- sense. Like I said, they forced Josh Allen to run for his life. Um, linebacker Shaquille Barrett had three sacks. Holy moly, just move him to left end at this point. Because um, that's all he do. That's all he does is blitz. Uh, he is, he is, he is, he is the blitz boy of linebackers. Um, so yeah, Frank Clark with, Frank Clark with two sacks, Shaquille Bear with three. Uh, now secondary, this is a toss-up. I could either give it to Jair Alexander, who has two, who had two interceptions, or I could give it to Sean Murphy Bunting, who has a, um, uh, an interception in all of the, in the Buccaneers playoff games, but obviously for this week. He had that um, really important interception that uh, set up that play to Scotty uh, Miller, like I was talking about earlier. So, um, I don't know. If I personally had to do it, I would give it to Murphy Bunting just because his his um, interception was just so important to that game uh, compared to Jair Alexander, who I bet he just, he just had, like, two interceptions, which is, um, like, incredible like that's pretty hard to do you don't see it that often but um yeah i i just think due to the magnitude of uh murphy bunting's play i would give it to him over jayu alexander but definitely a major honorable mention for him uh on on to the news now for the M- uh, nfl not a whole lot of like news necessarily but there was one huge huge thing matthew stafford has officially been traded um, it came out on, like, Thursday that it was, like, he was going to be traded before the Super Bowl. Um, so whether that was going to be this past week or, uh, this upcoming week, um, it would just happen before the Super Bowl. And, uh, news broke, I believe it was Saturday. Um, so, there was, there was, like, a lot, I've heard a lot of different people say, like, uh, who they think, like, got what, but the... Uh, I'm not, um, this is, like, official. The Detroit Lions received Jared Goff, two first-round picks, and a third-round pick. And the Rams get Matthew Stafford. Now, I'm not so sure what those, what year those picks are. I believe they're 2022 and 2023 firsts, and then a 2023rd. And then, obviously, Rams get, and then it was just a straight-up swap for Stafford and Goff. Um... So, uh, I'm going to give what I, I, I think, I think the Lions definitely won this trade by far. Um, they got two first round picks for an aging quarterback in Matthew Stafford. And yes, he is still a top 15, possibly top 10 quarterback in the NFL. Um, uh, Goff, he has shown potential. He has not played, but he's shown potential, but he's just not, um, he's just not, consistent whatsoever like he'll be playing amazing like like they like they were going to the Super Bowl and then next week they, they lose to the Rams so uh I I just think that um um I I think the Lions completely robbed the uh the the Rams anymore I don't think the Rams have a first round pick until like 2073 um Obviously, that's wrong. I don't think they have a first-round pick until, like, 2024. That is sad. Rip the Rams. Um, so, yeah. It, it, it's, um, and, the, yeah, the the Rams won the trade short-term. I'm going to say that. But the Lions won it, like, long-term success for the franchise. Because I do believe Jared Goff can, can be a possible top uh, not, I'm not gonna say, like, top 5, top 10, or anything like that, but, you know, around that 15, you know, like, right around, um, middle of the range, slightly above average, uh, or above average quarterbacks in the NFL, he's, he's shown it, he just needs to play consistently, and maybe biting off some kneecaps will help, and yes, every time I talk about the Lions, I will bring that up, I, I do not, I'm not scared of that, um, so, yeah, um, I definitely do think, that the um, Rams won this trade short-term. They get Stafford. He's going to be good for another f- 
three, three to four years. He's gonna stop. He's gonna start dipping off in around six or so years. Um, he's thirty three right now. Um, his contract still has two years, hundred uh forty three million uh two years forty three million dollars on it. Um, which is um you know for Rams for the Rams team that likes to you know use homegrown talent guys like Aaron Donald who yes is did sign a massive extension. Uh, but guys like Robert Woods and um, Cooper Cup, guys like that who aren't um, going to get a whole lot of money in free agency. Uh, uh, so yeah, they they have the cap space to do it. I I think this is a good move for the Rams now. But give it five years because you know uh, the the picks that um that they've given up in years prior. One of them was Derrick Henry, and to be honest, I'd much rather have Derrick Henry over. Jared Goff. So, but given that, uh, I, I, I definitely do think, like, you're like, I think, I would say the Lions won this trade, but, and it, if I just think about this for a minute, I would say the trade was neutral. Yes, you get, you get, um, you get two firsts on, you trade two firsts and a third. That, and Goff, who, staff, who, I think that is overpaying, but, I do think the Rams have a Super Bowl roster. They just needed a good quarterback, and Matthew Stafford is that guy now in L.A. Um, I just, and, um, you know, Lions get a guy who has shown potential, uh, who has shown potential before with the Rams and just needs maybe biting some kneecaps off, and now he'll be, you know, like, play consistently at that, you know, like, level that we've seen before in their Super Bowl run. Because I think Cam Akers is great. Robert Woods, um, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, um, Tyler Higby is not a, Tyler Higby and Gerald Everett. Maybe they could work on that tight end. I believe Johnny Smith is a free agent. That would be a nice pickup. I think he works very well in that scheme out in L.A. But yeah, you look at that Rams offense. You're like Cam Akers, uh, Matthew Stafford, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, um, the two tight ends, Gerald Everett and Tyler Higby. Look at that O line. Yes, Andrew Whitworth is probably likely to retire, um, but they could always just replace him with Trent Williams. You know, like I said, he's a free agent. Um, so, I and then the defense is gonna be amazing. Leonard Floyd, um, Aaron Donald, obviously Jalen Ramsey, John Johnson, uh, just so many guys you could go on and on on that defense. So I, if I just really just thought about it, I'd say this trade is uh, neutral. But given but knowing my luck, it's probably going to be like, given 20 years, Jared Goff is going to be like the best quarterback of all time. So, because I said this trade was neutral. So, yeah. And now, on to the biggest news of all time. The 2021 Pro Bowl Madden 21 edition happened yesterday. And uh, if I had to be honest, it was not as bad as I thought. I thought it was going to be a cringe fest. And yes, it was cringy at times, but I think it was very entertaining. I, I definitely think you should watch it. It's about an hour and ten minutes long. Um, I woke up super early this morning because um, the, the the snow. I don't I don't know why I woke up super early. Uh, I just did. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, yeah, it's hour and ten minutes. I would tell. I would definitely recommend it. It is so. It is super entertaining. Uh, with some cringe moments. Um, on the cringe scale, you know, like, one being is not, like, not cringy, like, barely at all, and being, like, and ten being, like, super cringy, I'd probably give it a three or four. Um, I definitely think one thing that could have made it better was just pretty much just cut out Carissa Thompson and Michael Strahan. They were the cringiest parts, part about it, uh, cause, like, you know, Jamal Adams would be getting hyped, like, his mic volume was all the way up, so if you're watching it with headphones like I was, just beware of Jamal Adams. Um, you know, he would be getting hyped, you know, after, like, an interception or something that he had. And then Chris the Thompson would be like, oh, yeah, do you think that's, like, represents, act like, rep like what you actually play like? And he was like, and he's just like, yeah, let's go, and all this. <laughs> and then she just tries to ask this question, and he's getting hyped, and he doesn't hear him, so they have to ask it, like, five times. Um, it's just, I just think Chris Thompson and Michael Strahan just definitely just were the worst part about it, obviously, other than it being on Madden 21, um, so, yeah, the Pro Bowl, not as bad as I thought, the teams, 
Um, AFC, Deshaun Watson, likely not for long. Uh, Deshaun Watson, Derrick Henry, Keyshawn Johnson, and <laughs> Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg for some reason. Like, yeah, I get it. He plays Madden, but it's, it's, it's Snoop Dogg. <laughs> it's Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Every time I think about it, it's just hilarious. And then for the NFC, um, we had Jamal Adams, Kyler Murray, Bubba Wallace, who is a NASCAR driver, if you don't know, and um, Marshawn Lynch. Uh, I, I, like, there were definitely guys that were that weren't too vocal. Um, you know, like Deshaun Watson just kind of laid back. So did uh, Derrick Henry. He did ha- uh, Derrick Henry did have this uh, one moment that uh, led to a bunch of memes. Um, but yeah. But the two main guys that were talking were uh, Snoop Dogg and Moshon Lynch, which is honestly I'd let them commentate an NFL game. That was that was an entertaining time. Um, to be honest, they should just do it for fun. I I think that would be interesting. But yeah. Um, you know, like Kyler Murray, he'd, he'd say stuff here and there. He mostly, like most guys only talked when they played. Um, you, you know, they talked the most whenever they played. Because if you don't know, they did, um, each quarter was a different matchup. So, quarter one was Deshaun Watson versus Kyler Murray. Quarter two was Keyshawn Johnson versus Bubba Wallace. Quarter three was Jamal Adams versus Derrick Henry. And then round four was Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Snoop Dogg versus Moshawn Lynch. And, um, but yeah, um, Marshawn Lynch broke his chair after, like, getting an interception, which, at, they were, he was already up by, like, 20, 24, I think it was, and, and you're gonna get hyped after an, a pointless interception with, like, 10 seconds left? Like, come on, I mean, I, I get it, you're a multi-millionaire, um, Probably in the hundred millions, but still, you're just gonna jump up and down after getting an interception with ten seconds left when you're up by twenty four in the twenty twenty one Madden in twenty twenty one Pro Bowl Madden twenty one edition. Like, what even is twenty twenty one anymore? I don't even know. Someone explain to me. Um, but yeah. Um, now this was a fun time. I will recommend. I I would recommend watching it. I will leave a link. Uh, in the description for you to go watch it if you want to. Um, I, I just, I think, here's my opinion on the Pro Bowl. I think it should be gone. I think the game itself is pointless. Yes, it's much like the MLB All-Star game where, you know, like, oh, you see, like, um, I don't know, a guy, a, a rookie like Chase Young, per se. You, it's like, and then you see a guy like, some guy you'll never play because, you know, like, um, like, Tom Brady, obviously, they gonna, they played each other, but, like, you see him out on the field, like, yo, what's up, let's grab a quick selfie, um, but it's much like the MLB also in that game, you know, they got, like, seven different guys mic'd up at one time, um, it's much like that, but I just don't think the game is that pointless, is, is pointless, in my opinion, I don't, it's not like it offers home field advantage in the Super Bowl, it's not like it does anything, it's not like, Who's gonna host the first game next year? Who's gonna have the opening kickoff? Is it the first game in the next season? No, that that doesn't it doesn't work like that. Um, so, and then especially when you already have the skills competition, which is what most people watch. No one watches the actual game. Everyone watches the skills competition because that's fun. It's exciting. So my recommendation is you literally Pro Bowl, the actual game itself. Um, but. You expand the skills competition to a, a like two day uh, thing, because like it it uh, is one day at the time and now, but if, you know if you made it like an all weekend thing like that, s- Saturday and Sunday, and you just make this ginormous event. Um, you know you have different guys, so like all of the players, like all I think they I think they have fifty three uh, roster um Pro Bowl rosters. All every single one has to compete at least in one competition. Um, I think that's a recommendation. So you know, like guys would you know like guys who like get all the media attention. Like also like for example, the AFC team. Everyone is gonna pay attention to Patrick Mahomes. Everyone would pay attention to Derrick Henry. But no one is gonna pay attention to the to like the offensive linemen per se. Sorry, offensive linemen. Like no one's gonna notice what. 
Ryan Kelly, the center for the, uh, I believe that's his name, Ryan Kelly, the center for the Colts, is going to do. No one, like, and I hate to say it, no one is going to care what he does. So I think if you make it so that everyone has to compete, and I hate, I, and I hate that I'm sounding like a fifth grade teacher here but at recess, but if you make it so that everyone has to participate, it's fair. It gets the natural, it gets the national spotlight on everyone. So I, I think that's definitely a recommendation that I would, you know, like, throw out to the NFL if I was working there. So, yeah. Uh, let me know what you think about the Pro Bowl, um, if you've watched it. And if you haven't, go watch it, then come back here and tell me what you think about it. Like I said, I will leave a link in the description to the Pro Bowl so you can watch it. Or you could just look it up on YouTube. Just look up Man 21 Pro Bowl or 2021 Pro Bowl or whatever, um, and you will find it. Uh, it was on the NFL, um, uh, NFL, uh, YouTube channel. Um, I was gonna do it for the NFL portion of, of the show. Now on to the MLB news. And, uh, I'm so ex- <laughs> I'm so excited there was actually news. Yay! Let's go. Alright, I'm gonna work with my, uh, with the lower, uh, signings and then work my way back up to guys like J2 Omuto and then a certain trade that I'm sure we all know. What happened? Um, so yeah, uh, first signing, Darren O'Day to the Yankees for one year, $2.5 million, and I'm, I, I like this trade, I, I was signing, I really like it, um, we got rid of Darren, uh, Autumn Adovino to the Red Sox, that, that's not ideal, that's not ideal, I would much rather have just cut him at that point, um, yeah, so he got traded to the Red Sox, and then we got cash, um, so, and then we replace him, with Darren O'Day, who has been so good for the Braves and the uh, Orioles and his crew. Obviously, got that funky delivery, the sidearm, submarine style. Um, one year, $2.5 million, great signing. They got a really, really good pitcher. And he can be almost as good, if not better, than Adam Ottavino. Um, we got a really good pitcher for dirt cheap. $2.5 million is nothing. We we have now have $8 million more to spend on a left-handed pitcher, which, God, the Yankees, please sign a left-handed pitcher and or batter. I literally don't care. Jock Peterson would have been nice, to be honest. Um, can play left field. Um, but speaking, speaking of Josh, Jock Peterson, yeah, like I said, Darren O'Day trade, amazing. Oh, uh, signing, amazing. Jock Peterson to the Cubs, one year, $7 million. Really good signing. I really like this. Cubs, just, they lost Schwerber, they replace him with Jock Peterson, which is an upgrade. He, Peterson can actually play defense. Um, Yeah, he can be a 270-plus average, 25 homers, 70, 70 RBIs guy. And the only reason he he batted like six in the Dodgers lineup was because that lineup was so stacked. Um, But yeah, and for $7 million, that is underpaid. When you take into consideration that Andleton Simmons is getting 10.5, and Marcus Simeon uh, is getting 18. The fact that they got Jock Peterson for 7. Jock Peterson deserves more than Andrelton Simmons. Yes, Simmons' defense is still amazing, but he can't hit for anything anymore. Um, meanwhile, Peters' defense is average, but his offense is really good. But yeah, with the Cubs, great fit. Gonna love hitting home runs in, um, in uh, almost said Fenway, Wrigley Field. Uh, Gonna love playing there, I think. Um, Obviously, just the history of that field. Um, And now, uh, Tommy LaStella signs with the Giants, but uh, here's the thing. No one knows how much this contract is going to be worth. Um, um, But the rumor is that it's three years, um, and if I had to guess, and, you know, like, taking into, like, market value of guys like Simmons and Simeon, I'd probably say around um, seven to eight. 9 million, probably in that like 8, 8 and a half range, anywhere from like 8 to 11 million a year for um, Tommy La Stella, because he has really come alive this too, he's really revived his career in these last two seasons with LA and Oakland, um, but um, great time, guy is, he's shown great skill the past two years, he can play all over the place, he can play first, third, second, can't play short, um, but yeah, uh, heading into um, Oracle Park, um, great fit, plays good defense, 
um, can play at first, like I said, with Brandon Belt, play second with Donovan Solano, or play third, which I think is what they should do. I, th- I think they should play La Stella over, um, over uh, Evan Longoria. Longoria is just not the same anymore, and it hurts to say because he was so good, um, you know, back in, like, 2015. Um, but, yeah. Um, Tommy Lasella to the Giants, love this signing so much for them, um, just really, just helps with that, um, I, I, they're not gonna compete for a division title by any means with the Padres and Dodgers, but they can compete for, you know, like, that second wild card, um, in my opinion, for the NL, uh, and then, you know, maybe they just get a magical run and make it all the way, I don't think that'll happen this year, maybe next year. They still need pitching, they still need outfield, they still need a lot of things, but, Giants start by signing um, Tommy Lastella. Love the signing. Um, next one, Angelton Simmons to the Twins. Ten year, oh, not ten years. One year, ten point five million dollars. I think it's. I think he got overpaid a little bit, considering that. Um, considering that Jock Peterson got seven. I'd say, um, I think these two numbers could be flipped. Um, you know, Peterson getting the 10.5 and the Simmons getting 7. Um, I could definitely see that happening, um, or like what I think would have happened, but, uh, they were in competition with, you know, like the Phillies who need, uh, who needed a shortstop with Didi Gugois, who we will talk about. Um, they needed, they, they had competition, they just had to sign him, willing to overpay a little bit, um, for him, but great, fantastic defense on Am- Andleton Simmons, one of the best defender, defensive shortstops we've seen in a long time in the MLB. Um, uh, average to below average hitting, which isn't amazing, but, um, you know, the Twins hitting coach, you know, he's turning guys like Max Kepler, really, and like guys who no one ever heard about, into absolute stars. So I really think that this could be a good fit for Andleton Simmons um, and... Uh, Jorge Polanco would just move over to second base, most likely, um, with this signing. And, uh, Didi Gugois is back with the Phillies. Two years, $28 million. Great signing. I really liked, um, I really like, uh, Didi Gugois. As you know, I'm a Yankees fan. He did so much with us. Um, um, he just did a lot with us. So I'm really happy that he's going to be back. Um, but... The Phillies, they're just not getting better. They're only just staying the same. Yes, they have been trying to make some offseason moves. Um, obviously, re-signing uh, Didi and the next guy we're going to talk about. Um, you know, they got guys like Ochi Bradley and, you know, like Hector Neris can be good. Uh, he's just he just hasn't been good the past two years. Um, and, then, um, and then Brandon Workman just imploded with the Phillies last year. I don't know what happened with Eddie Rose or with um, uh, Brandon Workman. Last year, but yeah, really good signing by the Phillies. Two years, twenty-eight million, fourteen million a year, which is about average, which is what I about expected for Didi. Um, you know, still arguably top ten. I- I'd say easily top ten, probably around that six or seven range. Shortstop in the MLB, in my opinion, probably some bias there. But yeah, he played really well in twenty twenty. People were worried how he's gonna do outside of New York, and obviously he played very well. Uh, um, enough to get a $28 million contract, so, yeah, um, speaking of the Phillies, uh, JT Realmuto, back with the Phillies, five years, $115 million, that's a lot of money, so, uh, great sign, I, I think JT Realmuto is the best catcher in the MLB, I don't, there was nothing that you could tell that would, um, make me think otherwise, um, so, they needed to bring him back if they wanted to have any chance competing with guys like the Braves or the Mets, or teams like the Braves and the Mets, um, who are only getting better this offseason. Um, so, I just definitely think that this was something that needed to happen, and it did happen. So, the Phillies, they get their two guys, still need that bullpen. The bullpen is still really bad. Um, so, yeah, these definitely still need to work on that bullpen. And then, you know, but uh, as of right now, I'd still say... Um, to quote, a fourth place team. Um, and now the last, um, not last, second last signing, Marcus Simeon to the Blue Jays, one year, $18 million. I will say they overpaid a little bit. 
I'd, I'd expected him to, you know, get around 18, um, probably around 15 or so would, would have been my guess for uh, Marcus Simeon, but it's still a good signing. We'll play, he's likely to play second base is what the rumors are saying. And now the Blue Jays are dark horse contenders. They still need that that pitching core, but, you know, an offense with Bo Bichette, Vlad Jr., now Marcus Simeon, who is really good. He obviously was third in MVP voting in 2019. Had just had down 2020, and, uh, you know, it was 2020, so. Yeah. Um, you know, in the outfield, then you got Teosco Hernandez, George Springer, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., Randall Gritchick, who is a great fourth outfielder. Um, they just need that pitching to get them over the hump. Um, and now you look at it like all the bad teams are just becoming worse and all the good teams are just becoming better. This is kind of ironic. Um, it's like the, it's like it's like Robin Hood is stealing from the poor and giving to the rich. So anyway, uh, last signing here, Eddie Rosario to the Cleveland Indians. I don't even know if that's what they're going to be called anymore to the Cleveland baseball team, one year, $8 million, and to be honest, I'm not sure why the Twins let him go, um, he was great for them, you know, good defense, a great bat for them, so, Indians get him, and I, I think that's an amazing deal, um, I definitely think that, um, uh, that, um, he has the opportunity to play really well, and, um, no, obviously, I would, I would have liked the Yankees to get him, and then, you know, maybe we trade Stanton, to the Indians, maybe you would have taken him, but anyway, does the Yankees need a left-handed bat? Eddie Rosario, guess what, is a left-handed batter, um, that, I think he would have been a perfect fit, obviously, he likes going opposite field a little bit more than pulling the ball, uh, which wouldn't help in his, um, quest to hit, like, 50 home runs in Yankee Stadium, but good signing by the Indians, um, just wish the Yankees would have gotten him, to be honest, and, uh, yeah, the Indians needed outfield help, and they got it um, with Eddie Rosario. Great signing by the Indians. Next, the big one, the biggest news of them all. Nolan Arenado, one of, if not, the best third baseman in the MLB. And uh, and $50 million as well are going to the St. Louis Cardinals for, the, for their number 9th ranked prospect. Um, and then some more in the 10, you know, like 30, uh, 25 range, somewhere around there. But this trade still needs to be agreed on by the uh, MLB Players Association, which I ju- just don't see it'll happen. Um, but yeah, I-, I think the Rockies, they're in full rebuild mode now. N- um, a lot of people expecting it was going to be a Bam Bam trade just like that. Um, you know, in the, you know, oh, Aaron Otto's gone. Oh, Story's gone. Bye-bye. Um, on that did not happen like that, but, you know, like, guys like Blackman, Story, um, Herman Marquez, Kyle Freeland, anyone that they can get for anything, I think will be traded, except for Ramil Tapia, I think Ramil Tapia is pretty good, um, and he will stay, though, I, I think he, I think he stays, since he's just young, but, yeah, I think this is the first domino to fall in the Rockies' fall, demise, whatever you want to say, um, but, uh, ironically, uh, everyone is saying this was a horrible trade by the Rockies, and yes, it was, this was, whew, unfortunate, you didn't even get a top five prospect for the best thing that has happened to your franchise in the past ten years, that's unfortunate, um, so, um, Nolan Arenado to the Cardinals, a lot of people are saying the Cardinals are the best traders, not just in the MLB, but in, the, not just in the NFL with the DeAndre Hopkins trade, but also in the MLB. Hashtag conspiracy. Just saying it. I'm just saying. So anyway, but yeah, um, back on a more serious note. Don't even get a top five prospect for the best thing that's happened in to your franchise in the past 15 years. It's horrible. Um, you get guys who have, yes, they've been in the MLB, but have not played great. Um, I believe one of those guys being Adam Gombert, who's a left-handed pitcher, I believe. Um, he played some time in the MLB this year, uh, was not amazing, um, but yeah, I, I just don't think there was any way that you put it, that, um, the Cardinals, uh, that the Rockies made a good deal here, and then they also are giving, like, 50 million dollars to the Cardinals, which I don't fully understand, but, like, I think it's just to help, like, pay for his contract, because, um, Cardinals are a little bit of a smaller market team, they don't have the money that... 
to afford him. So they were like, all right, we'll give you $50 million since we're going to be trading everyone um, and to help pay for his contract, um, which is a uh, ridiculously low contract. Um, so, yeah. Amazing trade by the Cardinals. Horrible trade by the Rockies. Uh, just to... Um, yeah, um, I, I I don't think there's any way that you can put it that the uh, Cardinals, uh, that the Rockies won this trade. Um, and some more news, some more recent news, I believe this one came out last night. The um, MLB like, owners has, have come out with a new proposed deal because obviously um, they declined the one that was... Um, um, the Universal DH and Expanded Playoffs, which makes no sense. Whoever did that, I want to find you. Um, so, yeah, because that's, it's just so dumb. I'm not sure if I said this last week. It's just so dumb. Why would you do that? Because, like, everyone didn't, no one liked the Expanded Playoffs. I, I, I think it worked for 2020, but no, it's not going to cut it this year. Um, now, however, I do love the Universal DH. That is something that I love to see. Um, obviously, if you say Universal DH is bad, bad, um, yeah, that's my opinions on it, um, so yeah, uh, the, but the new deal is a 154 game schedule starting eight days later than a normal season would, uh, with the Universal DH, and to be honest, if, if the players want, uh, and no expanded playoffs, and if the players want to play this season, they should just go ahead and accept this, like, this is the best thing they're gonna get, we don't want another, like, whole thing that happened last year, it was like, well, the players were like, oh, we want prorated salaries, and then the owner was like, no, yeah, no, it's just kept going, it was ridiculous last year, just, if the players are small, they'll accept this, they get what they want in the, in the, um, in the, uh, uh, Universal DH, and just, and they have to sacrifice eight games, and in my opinion, I do think the MLB season should be shorter, I think 162 is a little much. I think if you shorten it by about uh, 20 or so games, maybe make it a 140 game schedule, I think that would work a whole lot better. Um, I just think that 162, that, that number is just so large. It's like, eh, you have, they have to do it for 162 days? And, and you know, like, they, and yes, they do get, like, I think, like, tw- like however many built-in off days, um... It's just like, but still, like, 162, in my opinion, is just too much. I still think 154 is too much. Uh, I think a, a good number would be around, you know, like, one um, 140. Anywhere in a, around that range would be good. But, yeah, back to the proposal by the owners. Um, players are smart. They accept this. Uh, this is the best offer they're going to get, I think. I think the owners also don't want to happen what happened last year. It was like, yes, no, yes, no, and all that. Um, I think that's why the owners just went out and was like, this is our best offer. Take it or leave it. Um, and, and it was like prorated salaries with it as well, which is like, who cares? You're getting eight games worth pay. That's probably like $500 probably. I don't know. Mike Trout, that's probably like 500000 but anyway. Um, yeah, it, it, they're smart. They'll just accept this. I, I don't think they want to what happened last year happen again. I don't think the owners want it. Um, it would be bad for the sport that that would happen two straight years, which is just ridiculous. But yeah, they should definitely accept that. Um, so yeah. Uh, and one last thing I forgot to mention was, um, the artwork that you're seeing on the screen, uh, during the, uh, you know, I was talking about the free agency signings. Um, those credit me for making those, believe it or not. Yes, I've gone, um, I've done, I've, I've made those. Um, so yeah, I want to point that out. If you were trying to find those, don't, can't find them anywhere on the internet practically. Unless someone stole my artwork, which was not, which would not be nice. But anyway, that is going to do it for this week's episode. Oh wait, I forgot some sad news. News this, uh, this morning on one of the best players in the past, um, decade decade and a half, Dustin Pedroia has retired from professional baseball, um, as much as I don't like the Red Sox, um, Dustin Pedroia was just amazing, he was just so good at what he did, played second base for as long as he could, and just unfortunately, since 2015, I, his body just could not hold up, and if you saw my David Wright, um, review, which I, you should go watch, I like that, I like making that video, uh, their, their careers just ended the same way. Just one major injury that um, 
happened on a defensive play that just really derailed their entire career. For David Wright, who was trying to die for third base. I'm not so sure what it was for Dustin Pedroia, but it was like that one major injury. They were able to come back. They were playing for another couple of years, and then uh, just it reaggravated or something else happened, and then their just body could not hold up. But yeah, Dustin Pedroia, who played a, a, for a long time, he he tried to make it um, as long as he could in the MLB, but this this was a long time coming. Um, I just don't think um, his body could hold up for much longer if he kept playing. So yeah, Dustin Pedroia um, will forever be known as a, as one of the greatest Red Sox to ever play. Um, one of the best. Now, I'm not going to say one of the best second basemen, but definitely a um, second baseman that many people will remember. Obviously, was a part of the uh, was a part of one of the um, World Series champs for the Red Sox. Um, I, I believe. Um, so yeah, Dustin Pedroia will forever be remembered as a Red Sox, and I wish him a happy retirement. Um, obviously, I I, I think. This was just a smart decision. Obviously, he didn't end his career like short by any means. He he really was trying to come back, just unfortunately could never do it. So yeah, hate to end it on a little bit of a sad note, but uh, yeah, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the New Flame Sports Podcast. If you like this episode, go ahead and hit the like button. Share these videos with your friends and family, and um, leave your comments down below. I love seeing them. Um, you know, give me what you think about that Stafford trade or NFL. That. Or MLB uh, free agency signings, or any of the rule changes that I had said, like the penalty challenge. I guess this one isn't a rule change, but you know, like the Pro Bowl change. So, just let me know what you think about those. Um, I love seeing them. We Re- uh, respond to as many of you guys as I can, um, which I all of them pretty much. Uh, so yeah, we'll see you next week.